My name is Paul Bastard and I work at the Imagine Institute and at the Rockefeller University and I received the Michelson Philanthropies and Science Prize for Immunology for my essay, Why Do People Die of COVID-19? I came to the field of immunology because uh, it's an absolutely fascinating and sort of unlimited field. It applies to basically every infection and we are all exposed to infectious diseases and so Understanding immunology is really understanding our relationship with our environment and how our body responds to it. My research focuses on understanding why people suffer of severe infections, especially why people suffer of severe or even die of COVID. This has huge impact because if we understand why they had severe infection, we can prevent it, not only for them, but also for all the other patients. The ultimate motivation that keeps me going is really the hope of people being saved because of our research. And by this, I mean applying our basic research to the clinic. It was really wonderful to see how our team's effort uh, was able to be applied directly to the patients and uh, to administer specific treatments to some of the patients that were already hospitalized because of COVID. The Michelson and Science Prize is definitely going to have a huge impact on our work and on my research. It already has shed a spotlight on what we did on our field, which is fantastic. And it's going to lead to a lot of fruitful collaborations and to a lot of big discoveries because it recognizes the importance of understanding why people suffer from severe infections. Good morning. My name is Paul, and I'm extremely honored today to uh, present the work that was recently awarded the Michelson Philanthropies and Science Prize for Immunology. And I'm extremely uh, grateful for this award. Uh, it's a huge honor. So today I will briefly discuss uh, the work we have been doing for the last two years, and especially trying to answer the question, why do people die of COVID-19? So here what we've seen and witnessed in the last two years is uh, our overcrowded ICUs, as you can see in this image here. When we remember and look in uh, what happened in history, we can actually realize that what happened since 2020 actually is very similar to what happened in previous pandemics, such as the Spanish influenza pandemic in the 1918. This is an image in the Massachusetts hospital in 1918. And on the right hand side, you can see an image in the hospital in Spain in 2020. So to the question of why people die of COVID-19, many very large studies have attempted to understand some epidemiological factors. The, although many um, comorbidities have been associated with severe COVID-19 and death following COVID-19 pneumonia, the factor that is associated with a increased risk of death really is age. And as you can see here with the risk of death increasing a twofold every five years. Nevertheless, within the same age group and within patients with the same comorbidities, there still is huge inter-individual variability. So uh, with the COVID human genetic effort, Jean-Laurent Casanova teamed up with Helen Sue to try to understand why some people had more severe infections. And here, the idea was to recruit as many individuals as possible, either with very severe COVID-19 pneumonia, or on the other hand, uh, patients or individuals with asymptomatic or mild infection. So this effort uh, was relatively successful as it recruited more than 10,000 individuals worldwide from more than 400 hospitals. The idea was to sequence the exome and genome of these patients and to also look for immunological factors that could explain once why some individuals had a susceptibility to suffer from severe COVID. And the first hypothesis that we tested was if some patients could have genetic inborn errors of immunity 
underlying their severity of their COVID-19 pneumonia. So the first pathway we decided to study was a type 1 interferon pathway. Uh, type 1 interferons, since they were discovered in the 1950s, have been shown early on to be one of the most potent antiviral family of cytokines. It's actually an interesting family because there are 17 members, 13 interferon alphas, one interferon omega, and one beta, who are all circulating interferons, and then epsilon and kappa, who are more tissular interferons. It's interesting because all these interferons bind to the same receptors, interferon alpha receptor 1 and 2, leading to a very quick antiviral signaling pathway. So we focused on the first cohort of about uh, 800 individuals who had suffered from life-threatening COVID-19 and surprisingly realized that between 1% and 3% of adults who, had, who were previously healthy carried inborn errors of immunity affecting either the production of type 1 interferons or the response, meaning they had a deficiency in type 1 interferons overall. And as you can see here, very surprisingly, we identified several individuals with complete deficiency in this pathway because of a deficiency in the receptor of type 1 interferons called IFNAR1. And as you can see here, the patient does not respond to interferon alpha or beta while the control does. This is very surprising because the previously known patients who had IFNAR1 deficiency were usually suffering from severe infections in early childhood. Now, these findings, first of IFNAR1 and the other genes in the type 1 interferon pathway, comprise for usually young individuals. So we wondered if other um, deficiencies in the type 1 interferon pathway could also lead to life-threatening COVID-19, perhaps in more individuals, and perhaps in the elderly. And so for this, we focused our attention on all 20 bodies against type 1 interferons. These auto antibodies were actually known since the 1980s in patients treated with interferon for several diseases, in women with lupus, in patients with thymoma, and were thought usually to be clinically silent. Nevertheless, when we look back in the literature, we can find an article from Ian Gresser in 1984 showing that interferon deficiency because of type 1 interferons can lead to severe vis a -vis infection. And then we heard about three patients who we knew had all 20 bodies against type 1 interferon because of an autoimmune disease called APS1 and who suffered from critical COVID-19. So knowing the critical role of type 1 interferons to fight viruses, knowing that genetic deficiencies in this pathway can lead to severe COVID, and after hearing about the th these three patients that were children who suffered from severe COVID and had auto antibodies against type 1 interferons, we wondered if these auto antibodies could not indeed underlie life threatening COVID 19. And so, uh, in several studies in 2020 and then 2021, we found that more than 15% of patients with life threatening COVID 19 pneumonia carried neutralizing auto antibodies against either interferon alpha 2 and or interferon omega. Rarely, they also had auto antibodies against interferon beta. What was interesting is that these auto antibodies were found before infection in all cases tested, meaning they pre-exist the infection and are not caused by it. Also that most of these patients with auto antibodies were men and were usually over 65 years of age, suggesting that these could explain some of the risk factors to suffer from severe COVID-19. And interestingly, the, these findings were replicated worldwide, showing that there does not seem to be any geographic or ethnical background underlying these autoantibodies. So to show and confirm that these autoantibodies were indeed the cause of infection and not just an association, we teamed up with Charlie Rice's team at the Rockefeller. And what they did is an experiment in which uh, we infected control cells with SARS-CoV-2 in presence of interferon alpha, one of the type 1 interferons, plus plasma, either of healthy controls or patients with the autoantibodies. So when we look at the two blue lines, um, interferon alpha here is able to completely block the viral infection, leading to no detectable virus. Whereas when we incubate, not with healthy controlled plasma, but with plasma of patients with autoantibodies, the, these autoantibodies completely block 
the protective effect of type 1 interferon and lead to very high viral load. And here it's very surprising because if you look at the plasma dilution, even when we dilute 100, 1,000, 10,000 times, these O2 antibodies are still able to block the protective effect of interferon. So overall, we realized that these O2 antibodies could lead to severe COVID pneumonia. And we then looked at the epidemiology of these auto antibodies in patients with severe COVID and realized that although they were present at all ages, they appeared to be more frequent in the elderly, reaching more than 20% of individuals after 80 years old. There's also a high prevalence in men, uh, as I described previously. And so based on these results, we wondered about the prevalence of these auto antibodies in the general population whose samples were collected before COVID-19 arrived. And here we tested more than 34,000 individuals who were previously healthy and who, who had not been infected with COVID. And when looking at the prevalence of the autoantibodies blocking these interferons, we realized that it was relatively low before 65 years of age, between 0.2 and 0.3%. But then suddenly around 65, 70 years reached um, a much higher prevalence going all the way up to more than 4% after 85 years of age. And we also see a higher prevalence in men after 65 years, where there's an increased prevalence in women before the age of 65. So overall, these O2 antibodies are rare below 65 years of age, but then increase sharply with age after 65, 70 years old. So overall, O2 antibodies against type 1 interferon underlie critical COVID-19 pneumonia, as do inborn errors of type 1 interferon immunity. And this first step of blocking the immune response leads to a very high viral replication. And then as a second step, the over immune response leading to the infamous cytokine storm. So for the inborn errors of immunity, we usually find them in young individuals below 60 years of age. And while for the auto antibodies, they're found at all ages, but are much more prevalent in individuals over 65, 70 years of age. The biological implications are important. It's quite uh, ironic that autoimmunity attacking intrinsic immunity can lead to severe COVID-19. But this could nevertheless explain the increased risk of severe COVID in the elderly. This has obviously important clinical implications because looking for the autoantibodies can be done easily and quickly with a simple ELISA. These patients should be vaccinated and get boosters as early as possible. And in case of infection, we can treat them with uh, various antiviral cytokines, uh, such as interferon beta, other antivirals, multiple antibodies, or if uh, they are already severe, think of antibody depletion. Now, these findings led to many uh, new questions. What about other viral infections? What about other autoimmune diseases associated with these autoantibodies? Can we think of specific treatments to remove these autoantibodies? And finally, what are the causes of these autoantibodies to type 1 interferons? And these are the questions we're trying to tackle now. With this, I'd like to th say merci beaucoup. A huge uh, thank you to Dr. Gary Michelson and Michelson Philanthropies for awarding me this prize, to uh, Seth and all Science Magazine and, and their teams. Uh, this has been a huge honor for me. Obviously, I'd like to thank greatly the physicians, their patients, the patients and their families, because despite the COVID-19 pandemic, they have continued to recruit and send us samples. And without them, none of this would have been possible. Obviously, the COVID human genetic effort, our lab, Jean-Laurent Casanova and Laurent Abel, who lead the lab, and then the autoantibody team who's, with whom we've been working on these projects for the last two years. Thank you very much.